What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is Big Dogs Got Eat, BDGE Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. That is Noah at FB Got on Twitter. Make sure you are following both of us. Today, we're going to break down a few more tiers in our rankings or the general consensus rankings, the public's rankings. We did a video like this a few weeks ago where we took guys that are very closely ranked in the same tier and kind of broke down each guy, the pros, the cons, who we would take out of that tier. We're going to do that again today with some controversial tiers. I know we have the mixture of those third round running backs, you know, the Marlon Max, Aaron Jones, Karen Johnson's. We're going to dip into that later end of the tight end position, the, you know, the back half of the, the top 10 tight ends. And then I'm not sure if we have one or two more tiers that we're going to break down, but that's what we got on sorts for today. Um, I'm not sure. I, do we have any more housekeeping notes to throw in before we jump into the video? I don't know if we were doing something with the draft guide or kind of just my, my mind's all over the place. You want to do another giveaway maybe? Not Good really, way. but we could do that. I don't really. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have anything to add really. We're, the other tier that we're going to talk about is those mid-round wide receivers, a guy like Chris Godwin, Tyler Lockett, um, Boyd, and Calvin Ridley. All right. That sounds good. Um, so without having to keep you here too long, we're going to jump into the video and hit the intro. All right, so this first tier we're going to break down. And if at any point you're enjoying the video, let us know that by, one, showing us a comment down below, two, hitting that thumbs up button. All you got to do is scroll down a little bit. First tier is these third round running backs. We have Marlon Mack, Carryon Johnson, Aaron Jones. At this point, you're probably sick of hearing me talk about these guys. In yesterday's video, I broke down Carryon Johnson and Aaron Jones pretty in depth. So what we're going to do for this first tier is we're going to get general thoughts from Noah. And I'm going to maybe play devil's advocate and poke some holes and see where we differ on these guys. So, Noah, of these three, who are you leaning towards taking? Because they're very close. Um, they have a great mixture of upside and floor. And all three guys can probably – be considered breakout candidates. I could easily see any of them, you know, finishing the year as a top 10 fantasy running back. What are your thoughts on them? Yeah, each one of these guys, in my opinion, has a concern to them. Like, obviously, Aaron Jones right now, his hamstring injury isn't a good thing to happen, especially with a new coaching staff coming in. And he's a guy who had to earn the trust of his last coaching staff. I mean, you look at last year in the beginning of the season, up until week eight, he, was, he didn't top a 40% snap share. So, I think him with the hamstring injury right now and their rookie running back Dexter Williams kind of getting run with the first team as it stands kind of puts him – like I have no concerns that he's going to win the job. I think that's just a concern you have to have heading into the season. Um, as for Marlon Mack, it's obviously the third down work is the biggest concern. But as we'll get into it later, I'll bring up a point that I think kind of helps him. I think Paris Campbell actually helps him on um, that addition, but this is just general thoughts. And then obviously with on Johnson, they cut Theo Riddick, which – is a good sign that shows that they have confidence in him taking over that third down role. But at the same time, they bring in CJ Anderson, who we saw last year on fresh legs really produce. And I think he's going to maybe eat into that goal line work because even last year with LeGarrette Blunt, who was like 35 years old and 350 pounds, like he took 11 goal line touches and carry on Justin only had two. And I know carry on played a limited season, but he didn't show that he could out, not out produce, but like out touch um, LeGarrette Blunt on the goal line. And I think CJ Anderson kind of has that same, build where he's just going to be used in short yardage situations yeah it makes a lot of sense I wonder if uh LeGarrette Blunt you say 35 years old 350 pounds you think yeah. he gained, I'll be off at like 10 on both 10 and 100 on both he, yeah he just gains 10 pounds for every year <laughs> he gets older by like 45 will be 40. <laughs> I feel like all running backs just get out of the league and immediately get super super thick but back to the point yeah LeGarrette Blunt was a guy who had um 17 Red zone carries, I believe, or it might have been 10 zone carries. 11 the five was 11, so I think it was 17 inside the uh, 20. Yeah, and that, that's obviously a concern. My bigger uh, – one of the bigger concerns with me for carry on is that we haven't seen him hold up over a full year, you know, with the workhorse role. And they started getting more acclimated to it and giving him those touches. And those five weeks, you know, there was a buy in week six. Five weeks after that, you know, he was playing over a 50% snap rate. So he became the guy, and he averaged 100 total yards from scrimmage over that span. So we see what they want to do. I'm a little nervous that we haven't seen him hold up. Um, but we know with Matt Patricia, they want to run the ball and they want to run the ball close to the goal line. The concern for you, you said is CJ Anderson. I don't know. I like, I'm not as concerned with CJ Anderson. Like I'm, I'm 
kind of thinking of Carrion Johnson and Aaron Jones in a similar light in that I don't think I want either of them to get 25 touches. I think if, if they were used correctly, both of them would flourish. If in like an 18 touch roll, 18 to 19, 20 touches, seeing five, six, seven targets a game and not getting those, you know, pounding carries up the middle, two yards, three yards, four yards. The question becomes, which of the coaching staffs are, is going to be the one that actually uses them correctly? In my opinion, I, if I'm going straight up, yes, the hamstring is definitely a big concern for me. So right now, if I'm drafting today, I would probably put Aaron Jones beneath carry-on just because he's not healthy. But if it was, you know, if it comes August 30th, August 31st, and we know Aaron Jones is healthy, I have more confidence that Matt Floor is going to use Aaron Jones in the passing game. And I have more confidence, you know, it's kind of ironic, I have more confidence in him using a running back by committee there, which I think is a positive thing for Aaron Jones. Now, you know, I love Marlon Mack, and I actually would take Marlon Mack above either of these guys straight up right now. But that Andrew Luck calf thing is really, really, really scary. And yesterday when I was on the Fantasy Sports Network show and we had uh, Virginia from Inside Injuries on, she thinks that Andrew Luck is probably going to miss some time into the regular season. She thinks that this is a serious calf injury. And if that happens, if Andrew Luck is not fully healthy for the start of the regular season, you know, all bets are off for that Colts offense. Yeah, we saw the last time without Andrew Luck there. They brought in Brissett, and I think was T.Y. Hilton had like 950 yards, and nobody else got anything going. The only thing I could speak to as like an improvement if Luck goes down is now they have like one of the best offensive lines in football, whereas a couple years back they were really struggling in that uh, area of the field. And also their defense has really improved. So even if Brissett comes in, I still think they'll lean on Mack in the run game because you look at what they did in the playoffs, like very valuable games, obviously. He outtouched Naheem Hines and Jordan Wilkins combined 35 to 5. Mm-hmm. So they definitely have confidence in him being their lead workhorse back. Now, is he going to get all three down carries? Is he going to be there on third down? It's up in the air because even the coach came out and said that Paris Campbell is going to take away from Naheem Hines' role. And I think the fact that they bring in Campbell means on some third down, because Mac isn't like a terrible pass catcher. He had like a 10% college target share and it was like 78th percentile or something like that. I think Campbell being there, uh, running out of the slot, doing a lot of the same things that Naheem Hines can do, gives way for Marlon Mack to really play on third downs and give like a rushing threat on third downs. Because when Naheem Hines is out there, like the defense doesn't expect him to run up the middle if it's like third and five, whereas Marlon Mack can do that. Yeah. With If Luck misses time, I think, you know, I said all bets are off for the Colts, but I just meant at where they're currently being drafted. Like him and Hilton, Marlon Mack and Hilton are both basically third round picks right now. This would obviously affect Hilton a lot more than it would affect Mac because if you look at Mac's situation with the offensive line, the offense overall, um, we've seen a guy like Ezekiel Elliott succeed in an offense where, you know, it was even prior to Dak Prescott. Actually, no, wait, they came in the same year, right? Yeah, they were both rookies. Okay, yeah, but Dak wasn't a prolific – yeah, Dak was, it's not like Dak was a prolific quarterback or whatever. So we've seen um, – running backs succeed with bad quarterbacks, but in a very solid offense overall. So it would definitely hurt Marlon Mack not having Andrew Luck there because it will be the one who sustains drive and gets the passing downs going and gets the chains moving and stuff. But for Marlon Mack, if, if he misses time, if uh, Andrew Luck misses time, I don't think it's as big of a hit as people will probably make it out to be because he'll still be the main car- um, goal, goal line carrier. He'll still be the main guy who gets the carries in between the twenties. Um, so I think the workload will still be there behind a very good offensive line. So if we're saying all things equal right now, we say Andrew Luck plays. He's healthy for start of week one. Aaron Jones is healthy for start of week one. Um, Carry on Johnson is uh, he's already healthy. So all guys are healthy. What is your order uh, for ranking them? Half PPR. All right. I have Mac at one just because I think his floor is higher than the other guy's floor as like for the concerns because the Lions offense isn't as good as the other guys offenses. And Aaron Jones, I know we're taking Aaron Jones' hamstring out of it, but I just think his touchdown floor is extremely high behind that offensive line. And he also has just as high of a ceiling, so I feel safer betting on him. Um, assuming Aaron Jones' hamstring is healthy, I would put him at number two just because he has pretty much the same role as we're going to see out of carry-on, a guy who's going to get the – well, Aaron Jones kind of has, like, an easier path to touches on the goal line because even last year he was their goal line back and mostly their third down back when Ty Montgomery left. So um, I'm going to put him second because he has that full three-down workload in uh, a very good offense, much better than the Lions. And then I'll put Carrion Johnson third. But any one of these guys I think really has the floor of like a top 20 running back while they can all reach like – they can teeter on that RB5 like upside. 
Yeah, because you look at Aaron Jones and Carryon Johnson, and both of them are by far the best pass catching backs in their respective offenses. Where Marlon Mack's on the flip side, so it's like they all have floors and they all have really good ceilings, but they're coming from different angles, which makes it interesting. I would throw Carryon as the number three, um, also just because of the offense. Like if you're going to break it, they're all very close. Like I, I like all three backs, but if you're going to break the tie, I would play it safe and probably pass on the guy in the Detroit offense who has, you know, their offense is just as likely to be really bad and slow and not having a lot of scoring opportunities as it is to be actually good. And when you look at Green Bay or Indy, if, you know, their quarterbacks are healthy, you're going to assume that they're going to be, you know, top three, top five, top seven in scoring. And that always benefits the um, the running backs in their respective offenses. Yeah, quick question. Like, not taking all things equal, if Andrew Luck misses time and if Aaron Jones doesn't really, like, do anything in training camp and this lingers, where would you rank these guys? Because I think I would put Aaron Jones third. Yeah, so carry on would be my number one there. If this is the situation, if Mar- if Andrew Luck is missing time, Mac would probably fall down to around uh, fourth or fifth round pick for me. If if we haven't seen anything out of Aaron Jones, I I don't want to say he's off my draft board, but he's going to be moved down significantly because you know I like to say in fantasy football, don't find injuries because they will find you. So I'm super hesitant to draft anyone, regardless of their talent or their situation, who are coming into the year um, less than 100% because they are trying to get on the field. All These are athletes, right? They just want to play, and they're ready to play, but they're not physically ready to play. So they end up re-injuring themselves. So if we go by, you know, and I mean, there's still a month before the season, so I can't imagine Aaron Jones not being healthy. Um, but if, if that's the case, yeah, he would move down and probably be my number three. So go carry on, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones. Yeah, and even if it doesn't, I still think he has injury concerns because wasn't he the guy in the offseason that they were saying went down to like a 5.6% body fat and like lost weight? Yeah, that's why he needs to be used in a role that's going to benefit him and not – like people really are like, Aaron Jones so talented, he needs to be the featured workhorse. It's like you don't want Aaron Jones getting 25 touches. That's not going to end well for your fantasy team. Yeah, and guys like that who are efficient on limited touches like an Alvin Kamara, like if they get 15 to 18 touches a week in an offense like that and they get the valuable touches on third down and by the goal line, that I would take that nine times out of 10 over a guy who's going to get 20 touches on like, I don't know, the Lions offense. I, I know carry there right now, but I think that role in the Green Bay offense is so much more valuable than half the teams in the league. Yeah, exactly. So those are our thoughts on those third round running backs. If you have any more uh, questions about them, you could obviously drop them in the comment section. We'll do our best to get around to any and all comments. Let's move on to the second tier of players. Now, this is that wide receiver group that's at the end of the fourth round, early fifth round, all with – actually, they're all in pretty different situations, but I, I feel like you can lump them into a tier. They're all very young wide receivers. They're all exciting, probably because we actually haven't seen their ceilings yet, and I'm sure a couple of them will not hit their ceiling this year. A couple of them probably will, and we'll end up moving into you know the top 15, top 12 fantasy running backs – Talking about Tyler Lockett, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Boyd, and Chris Godwin. Who are you taking here atop this list and why? All right. So at first, going into this like blind, I was thinking Tyler Lockett all the way because he's going to be the number one and he's paired with the quarterback that loves to throw the ball deep and he's a deep ball receiver. But just looking into the numbers, I don't see a way where Chris Godwin doesn't see 120 targets this year and doesn't score like seven plus touchdowns I was I was looking at his a dot and I was looking at what Larry Fitzgerald had during his time in um, Arizona with Bruce Arians because he obviously wants him to play that role and I'll put the tweet up right now um, I'll, I'll read it off to you guys so Larry Fitzgerald's a dot over those five years was an average of 9.02 Chris Godwin last year was at 11.9 that's pretty that's like almost four uh, or three I can't do math that's almost <laughs> three yard difference and you look at Chris Godwin's uh, catchable target rate 72.6% was the 78th best. Then you look at Adam Humphreys, who's running out of the slot. Not quite the Larry Fitzgerald role because he's a much smaller guy and not like as dynamic, but his ADOT was 6.7, which was closer to Larry's than um, Godwin was. His catchable target rate was 86.5%, the 13th best rate. So if Chris Godwin is going to be working in and around the line of scrimmage, sure, his ADOT's going to suffer because he's not being thrown as far down the field, but the targets he's going to get are going to be so much more accurate he's actually going to catch the ball this time because it's not like he's dropping the ball it's just that they're not reaching him because Jameis Winston isn't known for his accuracy that's probably the, like the least known thing he's known for um and you look at the least you look known at, thing he's known for yeah whatever <laughs> I don't know how to say it. um 
if you look at the games when he's played over 70% of the snaps, he was on pace for 126 targets and only 46 catches. So he, his, his target rate was very high in the games that he actually played, but the catchable targets just weren't there. And I think him running out of the slot, probably going to see 120 targets, which is about like a 19.5% target share based on last year's volume. I think it's just going to bring so much value to him, especially because he's a guy who's going to work in the red zone. He led the team in red zone targets last year. He led the, t- uh, the team in inside the 10-yard line targets. So I think his role brings him a really high floor, and he has the ceiling of a top 10 wide receiver just because he's going to be used in high-value situations. Yeah, it feels like all of these receivers have high floors, and I guess maybe the tiebreaker would almost be who has the highest ceiling of these guys, you know, because you have Lockett who should be taking over as a number one, but it's not a high powered passing offense, right? Like Vegas has Russell Wilson pegged at like 3,600 passing yards for the year as over under, which is mind blowing, but probably realistic. And you have Calvin Ridley who is dealing with a hamstring injury, which makes me a little bit nervous about him. Um, And the doctor I talked to yesterday was also nervous because he dealt with a lot of injuries last year and he kept trying to play on them after he got hurt. But he's in that Falcons offense, which should go very pass heavy and should be very high powered in terms of just statistics coming out of Atlanta. Tyler Boyd. Question real quick about Atlanta. Go. Um, How do you think their defense is going to play this year? Because I was looking into their pass percentage and it increased 9% going into next year. And I'm not sure if that's a function of uh, Deion Jones getting hurt and a lot of guys going down. It increased. You mean going into last year, it increased. Yeah, from 2017 to 2018, it went up from like 56 to 65%. Yeah, that was, that was a function of us, um, our defense being fucking horrible and letting up so many points for a big stretch of the season that we were always in comeback mode. And there were so many games where we let up like 35 or 40 points in a row that we were just having to pass the ball the entire second half. My, my concern still is, you know, everyone's really high on Atlanta. I still don't think our defense is that good. We, we, this is something we've struggled with for almost like three or four straight years now. We don't have a pass rush. And we've been saying like Dan Quinn coming over from Seattle from the Legion of Boom is going to fix things, but it's been so long and it hasn't been fixed and we don't get pressure on the quarterback. And that ultimately equates to usually how, how well a defense plays overall over the long run. That's my concern. We like, we were assuming last year that our defense was going to be good. All the players got hurt. So it, it gives us an excuse to say, that's why I'm not completely sold on the defense being that good. So um, this could be a, a situation where the defense is still not good and we're passing the ball a lot. But, yeah, that, that's why we pass the ball so much. I don't think it was necessarily that just like, oh, we want to sling the ball with Matt Ryan. And Devonta Freeman got hurt, so we didn't have like a pure um, rusher, you know, for early downs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally get that. And I think it's kind of the same case for Tyler Lockett this year. And you look at the defense and the pieces that they lost, not due to injury, but they're just out of town. They lost Earl Thomas. Frank, Frank Clark is gone. And then going into 2018, they had no Richard Sherman. They had no Cam Chancellor. They weren't nearly the defense they have been in the past. And I think losing those two additional pieces this offseason and their first-round rookie, LJ Collier, is o- like already dealing with injuries. Yep. I think that they might be forced to throw a little bit more because they're in a division where they face the Rams, who are a high-powered offense. They face the Cardinals, who are a high-powered offense, or supposed to be, and even the 49ers this year. So I could see Russell Wilson topping like 30 attempts a game, which would come out to 480 attempts um, for a 16-game season. And that's not, like, too bold to say because last year was the first time he fell below that mark since, like, 2014. Yeah. So I think Lockett's going to have easily over 120 tar- 100 targets, and I think he has the ceiling of getting around 120 this year. And just the valuable looks he's going to get down the field and out of the slot with DK Metcalf kind of, like, opening up the field for him, I think he's got an extremely high ceiling too. I just think his week-to-week volatility is why I prefer a guy like Chris Godwin over him. I don't know why. I just, like, can't sell myself on Chris Godwin over Lockett. But when you look at the – I think what's going to happen is – this Bucks team is still going to be a shit show for the most part. Their defense is going to be terrible. Their offensive line is probably going to be bad. So I think, like, even if you – you know, Bruce Arians coming in is going to make the offense more efficient, whatever. I see a lot of garbage time happening. That's definitely where Chris Godwin can eat. So um, I, it's probably me needing to step back and look at it objectively and being like, it doesn't matter if that team is good or if you think Chris Godwin is good because I think – from a volume standpoint, it's going to be there because they're going to throw the ball a lot. So for right now, I'm probably still taking Lockett over Godwin, but it's close. Uh, I would go Lockett, Godwin. Um, right now, I'm going to take Tyler Boyd over Ridley because of the hamstring injury, but Tyler Boyd would probably be typically a close fourth if uh, if Ridley is healthy. Yeah, right now I have it Godwin one, 
um, Lockett two, Boyd three, and Ridley four because of Ridley's hamstring injury. I think he'll step into that wide receiver two role very easily this year in Atlanta. Yeah. And I just think having Matt Ryan, if he's healthy heading into the year, I'd easily put him ahead of uh, Tyler Boyd just because having Matt Ryan and being the number two in that offense, I think is more valuable than being like the one or two, depending on AJ Green playing, um, playing with Andy Dalton. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I love Boyd as a player, but now it becomes a very tough um, decision. It, it becomes tough to actually draft him in this group of guys. He was just such a good value when he was in, mm-hmm. you know, the eighth, the seventh, even like the sixth round. Now it's the early fifth. And you look at, like I said, most of these guys have great floors, right? Who has the best ceiling? You could probably easily argue that his ceiling is the lowest of these three just because of the offense that he's going to be in. So I, I would probably put Boyd fourth. Um, although I probably like him as a player more than I like Ridley, probably more than I like even Godwin too. But, you know, it's fantasy. You have to look at the situation before you just look at the player and the talent because the talent does not always translate into fantasy football production. Ready yeah. to move on to three? Uh, I was just going to say, and, like, it's not like A.J. Green's going to get any better, like, before the season starts. So I think uh, Tyler Boyd's just going to keep rising up draft boards. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's seen, like, as a top 20 receiver. And at that point, I'd be kind of out because you're taking him, like, at or near his ceiling at that point. Yeah, it sucks that he's in the Bengals' offense. But it is what it is. And uh, we're going to move on to the third tier of guys that we're going to debate. And that is the tight end tier at the end of the top 10 rankings. So, I find myself like I, you know, I, I want to grab one of the top three guys just because it's it's kind of a shit show afterwards. But it, it seems like, and maybe we say this every year, but maybe there's a little bit more depth at tight end than we're imagining because those mid round guys, OJ Howard, Hunter Henry, Evan Ingram, seem like like I would feel confident with either of those three guys in my lineup. And then once you get out of that tier, then we hit Eric Ebron, Jared Cook, and Vance McDonald, and. Realistically, I think I'd be pretty confident with, well, I think two of the three. We'll get, we'll kind of break it down. I I would be confident with the majority of those guys in my lineup too. They obviously come with a little bit more risk. Um, But I I do feel like the tight end position is almost 10 deep this year. So if you're in a 10 team league, you don't necessarily have to separate yourself by grabbing one of the top three elite tight ends. Uh, Is that how you feel too? Are you confident with these three guys, Ebron, Cook, or Vance McDonald in your lineup? One of them, I'm not confident and like at all really and it's Vance McDonald which might sound crazy because there's so many targets up in the air but he's never finished a season he's put up over 300 yards once like over four touchdowns once and it's not like they didn't bring in anybody right they drafted a guy in the third round in Deontay Johnson he's not a big red zone guy but if you look at Vance McDonald last year he wasn't dominating in the red zone either and I know they had Antonio Brown but he had the same amount of targets inside the 10 as James Conner and Jalen Samuels and Ryan Switzer so it's not like he's being heavily used in situations you'd expect a guy of his size to be used. He's, he's more of a guy who's going to catch a ball over the middle of the field and try to take it for a long game. And that's just like exactly what he did against Tampa Bay when he put Chris Conte into the dirt. And that one play was 12% of his entire receiving yards on the entire season. Yeah. He's just way too volatile for me to want to get him. I'd much rather just stream the position instead of paying for him. And the injury concerns are just way too much for me to grab him where he's going in the same range as these other two guys. Yeah, I think people are – completely surpassing the uh, injury concerns for Vance because, you know, like you said, he has never played a full 16 games last year. Like this is going to be his seventh year in the NFL. Uh, Not a lot of people realize that. And you can go back and kind of put everything into context and weasel your way out of whether or not you think all six of those years can be accounted for and why he didn't blow up or whatever. He is in a great situation though, because you have Antonio Brown leaving 169 targets, Jesse James leaving, and they split the snaps 50-50. And I actually like Vance McDonald. Um, as one of the guys that I'd be comfortable with in my lineup. I, honestly, actually, I, I probably wouldn't be comfortable with him as my starting uh, tight end, but I'm okay with it because, like, the volume is going to be there. And when you're waiting that far into a draft, like, you're kind of expecting that your tight end position is going to be very volatile. It's going to be risky there. I just think the position that he's in and the athletic um, prowess that he brings to the Steelers' offense, which is going to need that this year, they need playmakers giving up Antonio Brown. I think he will be very involved, but yeah, the injury concern is real. I put up a picture of his injury predictor, like all his history right now. And it's like 15 things deep. It's like knees, concussions, like everything that you can imagine. It happened to Vance McDonald. And for the position that gets as injured as it does, and if he's going to be leaned on heavily this year, more volume is just going to lead to him getting hit more. And I'm not sure he's going to be able to sustain like a full 16 game season. So, I mean, Vance had, what, like 70 plus targets last year. And given Brown and Jesse James being out of, uh, the situation, the picture. 
I mean, I, I could totally see him getting upwards of 100 targets. And, like, you're going to take that from your tight end position. So I'm, I'm okay with that there. Um, but his floor is very serious. Like, people are just kind of bypassing that. I, I don't think they're taking that into account that they might end up having to stream the position. And the tight end position is not one that you want to stream. So the only guy really I think that I'm comfortable with um, streaming – not streaming, uh, drafting in this group is actually Jared Cook. I really like Jared Cook in that New Orleans Saints offense. Um, I, I liked Ben Watson last year, and Ben Watson could have had a much bigger year. He dropped a couple touchdown passes, but he was targeted when he was on the field. He dealt with some injuries, but Jared Cook at this point in his career is much more explosive than Ben Watson was, even at this old age. He's coming off of one of his best uh, seasons. It was his best season, not from a consistency standpoint. This yeah, I, th I think his floor is probably the highest of these guys because you look at Ebron and you look at Vance, Ebron's, if he doesn't catch a touchdown, like what do you really expect from him week to week? And then Vance also a low floor because of his injury concerns. Jared Cook's going to be a guy, he's going to be their third target in this offense unless Traquan Smith just all of a sudden becomes the third, I think it was a third round pick, like that pedigree into his second year. Um, and he comes over from a team, I don't expect him to do what he did last year because it was the first time he was ever inside the top five, first time he was ever finished inside the top ten, and he was their number one target. I still think he's going to see upwards of 80, almost 100 targets. 80 to 100, I think, is a reasonable range. And I know the Saints don't really target the tight end too much over the past three years. They were they ranked uh, bottom tw uh, bottom 12 each season. The highest they ever did was 17% uh, percent of the time they threw the tight end. Could yeah. be the chicken or the egg argument, though. I mean, when they had Jimmy yeah. Graham, they used them to the fullest extent. You know what I mean? So they know how to use it. Like, when push comes to shove, they've shown that they could use it. So – I almost feel like Jared Cook is the second best option in this offense from the passing game, like outside of Alvin Kamara, not the backfield, you know? Yeah. I, I was just going to say, yeah, it, it's been low because the best tight end they've had over that span is Kobe Fleener. And he was kind of getting on in his career. Um, and Jared Cook is, he's older, but he's still athletic and he can make plays. I think his floor is pretty safe because he's going to be a guy who's going to catch probably 50 to 60 balls for 700, 800 yards. He doesn't get in the end zone too much, but I'd much rather have a guy who's going to get me 50 to 60 yards a week for that solid floor at tight end and try to bank on a touchdown from Eric Ebron. And then, obviously, the injury concerns with Vance McDonald. Yeah. Um, Ebron, Ebron just makes me nervous from the regression standpoint. But it's all, I guess I wouldn't hate having him. It's just with those guys, he's almost like the scat backs of tight ends because with Jack Doyle back and with all these new weapons, it's depending on a touchdown, right? Or you're depending – and it's going to be not game script dependent per se, but if he doesn't score a touchdown, what are you looking at? Like two catches for – 22 yards maybe some of the games and I don't know if I really want to rely on that so realistically I'm, I'm comfortable with Jared Cook I would probably I think in my rankings I have him Jared Cook Vance McDonald Eric Ebron right now uh, Dr. Moore said he's not necessarily concerned about anything with injuries that happened with Eric Ebron he is he is actually however concerned with Jack Doyle I think he rated him like a seven and a half or an eight out of ten for uh, injury risk in the draft guide um, which you can cop on bigdogsdraftguide.com but um, that would be good news for Ebron. Obviously, if Doyle's off the field and Ebron, you know, occupies that role that he had last year that he played so well in, we also have to consider the whole Andrew Luck thing, which we talked about with Marlon Mack, which makes him a little bit of a risk as well because if Luck's not in the lineup. That's going to absolutely bury Eric Ebron because we know how much Luck likes to use the uh, tight end position down there by the red zone, and that's where Ebron makes his money. So I'll go Cook, McDonald, Ebron. Um, I'm starting to get to the point where I'd almost put Cook in his own tier. It'd be like those three guys before him, then Cook, and then like maybe these two by themselves afterwards. Yeah, I agree with you there. I would just flip Ebron and McDonald. Um, I think Ebron and McDonald are pretty much the epitome of like streaming tight ends, but guys that you can kind of rely on on other weeks where they're not like matchup dependent. Yeah. I just think for those guys, you're, you're expecting Vance McDonald to like break a 50 yard catch for him to like return value. And Eric Ebron, you're expecting him to get like two red zone targets and turning one of them into a touchdown, which on a week-to-week -week basis, especially after bringing in Devin Funches, a guy who saw 28 red zone targets over the past two years, um, I just don't think that's – you can expect that out of – like on a week-to-week -week basis as you could last year because he was their only target inside the 20. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't even know really how I'm going to be attacking my drafts this year when it comes from the tight end position. I try to let it, like, come to me. Sometimes I know going into drafts that I'm like, I want to target this guy or that guy. Every time I pick a tight end up front, I end up liking my team less. Like, it's nice to see a George Kittle or a Travis Kelsey in your tight end spot, but that really screws you when it comes to your wide receiver two or your running back two. So in a majority of drafts, you're probably going to end up with one of these three tight ends. So I hope that we kind of helped you break down um, these guys and decide which of the three that you like the most at the position because it's probably going to be one of the three guys that you have in your lineup if you take a similar approach to your drafts 
as we do. I think that's all we got today for the video. Am I right, Noah? Yeah, that's all we got. All right, word. So that's all we got for you today. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're dropping five videos a week, Monday to Friday, every day throughout the summer. Go check out the draft guide. It is on sale now and it will help you for everything you need on your 2019 fantasy football draft. That's on bigdogsdraftguide.com. Go follow us on Twitter at Nick underscore BDGE at FB God. And we'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.